This is the session on expanding the capabilities of Kubernetes access control. If that's not why you're here, the door is right back there. <laughs> um, all right. So as we get started, I think it makes sense to understand who's up here and who's telling you and why you should listen. Um, I myself, I'm the co-founder of a company called AuthZ, um, as explicitly an authorization company, so that ties straight into this talk. Um, formerly, I worked at a company called CoreOS. Uh, CoreOS got acquired by Red Hat. Red Hat got acquired by IBM, and then I decided to start my own company. Um, I'm an OCI maintainer, so that's the specification that defines what containers are. Uh, so I also do that, and then I've been around in this space since kind of the beginning, since before Kubernetes existed in the container ecosystem. I've created a bunch of different projects in that time. SpiceDB, which is what my current company does, but also things like Operator Framework. Um, Lucas? Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I've also been here for, for some nine years or something. Um, I kind of uh, represent the Kubernetes side, and like, um, I've been thinking about how can we evolve Kubernetes in these directions. Um, been doing some cube stuff like cube admin and, and similar things in the past. Um, also doing the cloud native meetups, for example, in Finland. And you should definitely come to the Kubernetes community days that we're organizing in Helsinki uh, in May next year. Cool. All right. So this talk has an agenda because authorization is a pretty deep topic. We don't want to get caught in weeds. Um, so we're going to give a very quick overview through the foundations of authorization so everyone's on the same page going into this. Then we're going to take stock of what Kubernetes does for authorization. These are things that probably you all are familiar with. Um, but then we're going to talk about the challenges that exist with those primitives um, and kind of the problems that they are not addressing. And then we're going to kind of dive into future looking and uh, technologies that are going to help us kind of evolve with Kubernetes. Um, so I think it's by obligation that you always have this slide when you're talking about authorization. Um, there is this terminology, auth, and it's really ambiguous whether someone is talking about authentication or authorization. Um, for this, uh, this talk, the focus is entirely on authorization, so not authentication. And I prefer these completely alternative terms. Uh, terms because I think they're far less ambiguous. Um, that's identity for authentication and permissions for authorization. Um, and it's not just beginners that kind of make this mistake when they, they misspeak. Um, even staff engineers or very, very senior engineers often will say the wrong term. Um, but at the core uh, of every permissions check, it's this one question, can a particular principle perform an action on a resource? And it gets kind of confusing because there's a million different words for all these different um, kind of variables. So instead of principal, someone might say user, they might say subject, they might say identity, um, they might say policy instead of action or verb or permission, um, or they might say entity for a resource. And it, it all just gets confusing. But at the end of the day, checking a permission is just this core question. But um, the software then has to look very similar, right, if uh, they're all just trying to answer the same question. And kind of if you ask Gartner, they would give you this diagram, which is kind of using some enterprise-y jargon. Um, it, I, I tend to think it's kind of outdated and kind of makes the problem look overcomplicated. Um, but it has the same kind of terminology problem that auth does, where it's kind of using this acronym PXP, where there is PEP, PIP, PDP, which makes it super confusing to know what you're talking about. Um, and then it also is really focused on where and not what. Uh, and so, like, for example, they're talking about PEP as policy enforcement point. So that, that's, you're talking about point, like where. Um, but there is something good with this model, which is it introduced the idea of kind of separating the enforcement of a policy from actually computing and um, running the authorization logic that is making the decision. Um, so as an alternative, I like this far more simplified model where we just break it down into an engine models and data. Um, I really like the metaphor of a courtroom for describing this. So in a courtroom, you kind of have a judge or jury, and that's kind of what I call the engine in this. And they interpret laws along with facts and evidence from the case uh, together to ultimately make a decision of whether someone is guilty. So that's what all authorization software looks like. There are models that kind of define like the rules and shape of everything. Then there's data, which are similar to the facts involved. And then an engine interprets those two things together to say yes or no, someone has access to do the thing they're trying to do. So we make this a little bit more concrete. Um, this is kind of what OPA or uh, CEDAR, like a policy engine, looks like in that system. And we can kind of 
start to see where the different components of these, these languages fit in. So OPA, for example, the actual interpreter, is an engine. It's going to actually be doing the interpretation. Um, but Rego, or the Cedar policy language, that's kind of the model section. That's where you're going to define these policies that are more static. Um, and this really highlights uh, an important point, which is this empty box of where does the data come from when you're using these types of systems. Um, there's a bunch of different projects in the ecosystem out there trying to kind of fill in this box in various ways for various use cases. Um, but really, these policy uh, languages uh, really uh, shine best when you have very little data input or are working with requests that have all the context they need to make the decision um, in, the, in the actual payload of the request. Um, cool. But that data is actually super important because if we're talking about consistency with data, uh, you can get into a whole world of problems. And especially if you're making an authorization decision, that's a security flaw if you give access to the wrong thing or don't give access to the uh, right thing. So um, kind of leaning on that courtroom metaphor, what happens if you apply old laws to a new crime or new laws are applied to an old crime or old facts are applied to a new crime? Like people will go to jail and like the cases won't make any sense, right? So we have the exact same problems in authorization. If you're using outdated models or outdated data when you make these decisions, you're possibly giving access to a thing that you otherwise shouldn't. This is a good segue into what privilege escalation is. Um, <laughs> I'm sure most people here are familiar with this because they probably have to patch their own software um, and fix security flaws in that software. But effectively, privilege escalation is just when um, the model you have in your head doesn't match reality and someone gets access to a thing they otherwise shouldn't. Uh, this is usually caused basically by either an incorrect model or the complexity that comes uh, with crossing what we call trust domains. So uh, examples of some trust domains in the Kubernetes ecosystem are things like the pods and C groups, the machine, the network, the Kubernetes namespace, the cluster, the identity provider, and then any other clusters in a multi-cluster system. So you can see how there's this kind of stack of all these different um, domains, and there's plenty of users or programs that are constantly crossing through these domains in ways that you wouldn't really expect. So for example, if you use something like Cert Manager in your cluster, that is a global resource provisioning these things across your whole cluster. But you as an individual user with access to create an instance or uh, create some of these certificates are actually um, creating that resource. And then this global thing is working on your behalf, crossing all the way up to the cluster level domain. Um, so you can see how a lot of this is very confusing, and um, it's really easy to introduce new things. So there's even XKCD for this, as there is with all things. Um, and it's really describing this endless cycle where you create a trust domain, users ask for more features, which kind of cross the trust domains, and then you kind of like circle them and create even bigger trust domains, and then the loop basically just continues where constantly um, you're, you're kind of creating these new trust domains and then expanding them uh, ad infinitum. So uh, Lucas is going to give yeah. an example. So, so one example of this in, in Cube, uh, very specific, is you are able, able to create a deployment, for example. Cool. Um, deployment is inside of a namespace, so it's already inside of a trust boundary. But then you can refer to a secret in this payload of the deployment, while you might not have actually access to get that secret directly. Um, so what's going to happen is, as mo many of you know, is the deployment controller takes the deployment, creates a replica set. The replica set controller takes that replica set, creates a pod. The kubelet takes a pod, and kubelet has access to all of those secrets. So the kubelet can get the secret mounted into the, the pod, and now you have, have that. And this is a kind of very straightforward example, but when you start looking at all of these possible privilege escalation cases, you start getting this into this graph that you see here uh, by Datadog. Uh, they made a CubeHound project where they kind of um, made a fictional cluster, um, but kind of with, with sensible settings and stuff. And they, they put everything in a graph. They have, this, I mean, a lot of well-documented attack paths in Cube where, for example, you take over a service account or or you can read a secret that you shouldn't be able to use that secret to, to go further in the cluster. And uh, yeah, there were hundreds of, of uh, you know, getting to cluster admin access you know, through this, even from the, the kind of entry point of the cluster. So 
it's, it's kind of a, an interesting, like these controllers should be secure monitors, but it's very, very hard to do that um, in, in a generic sense, or there's no way to do that in a generic sense, and, uh, and you need to be very skilled to, to kind of consider that in your API design. All right, so there's a history in kind of researching authorization and the models that um, folks are familiar with. In this slide, I basically just outlined the ones that people are really likely to already be familiar with, but there's plenty of other research that have been going on for the past few decades. The thing with this is I feel like a lot of folks out there look at the history of database research and they go, oh, People have been studying this for decades. I sh probably shouldn't build this myself. Like, there are probably experts that study this that should be building this. But then they look at authorization, which is even more security critical, and they go, I bet I could probably build this myself. <laughs> <laughs> probably not the how, best idea. How, how hard can an if check in the API server be? Exactly. Yeah. How hard can it be? Um, but the, the thing that I also kind of wanted to highlight with this is um, a lot of this stuff has been documented in kind of research. But then also there's implementations in software that kind of coincide or come either earlier or after the research was published. Um, notably here, you can see uh, the third option, ABAC. It had a research paper written in 2015. Probably everyone thinks that's like really cutting edge stuff, but actually it was in Multics in 1965. It was how they were securing the file system all the way back in the day. So a lot of people think that like, wow, I'm doing the latest best practices. They probably think something like RBAC is the latest best practice, but it actually isn't. And a lot of these systems have been around and a lot of the concepts have been around for 50 plus years. Um, but that was us covering authorization super, super fast. Now you're up to date. Um, but we really need to start talking about Kubernetes because that's why we're here, or at least that's half the conference here. Um, so we're gonna dive a little bit more into how Kubernetes works. So in order for you to be able to answer the question of can a user do this, uh, well, you need to know what, who the user is. And uh, for Kubernetes, there's a couple of well-known modes for resolving this question. Um, you can authenticate the user through OIDC tokens. Uh, you can you kind of have Kubernetes hook out, send a webhook to something else outside of it, which will answer the same question of what, what the user is this token about, or you use a client certificate, um, well, a CA for, for authenticating. Then we get to the authorization stage, and now we have the user information, so like username, a couple of groups, maybe a UID, and some, maybe some extra information, and then at this point, we don't have the body deserialized yet because we don't want that a random person would send us a huge amount of, of data for us to process when they were actually not allowed to do so in the first place. Um, so, and here, like for the authorization, authorization strategies, we have, well, cube RBAC or, and uh, webhooks as well. And once they pass that and we figure out that they are able to, I don't know, create deployments, then we actually look at the deployment, like, okay, so is this data any good? Uh, this notably only happens on create, update, delete requests, uh, and connect. And here you have some other options. Again, there's a webhook. I mean, Kubernetes is super extensible. It's really nice. Um, of course, webhooks have some uh, runtime um, challenges as well, but, uh, but it, it's, it's possible. Uh, one of the new things that we're gonna talk about in a bit is uh, the use of common expression language, or cell as a way to kind of writing these um, validation uh, and admission, uh, validating and mutating admission controllers. So like adding policies, checking that, well, for example, the, you have, you're using secure images in your, in your uh, uh, cluster. Then answering the, the question of who can do what, or like, can I do this? For example, is called uh, a subject access review in Kubernetes, if you ever come across that. Um, the roles in Kubernetes, so Kube RBAC is, is divided into two parts, the roles, and this kind of selects uh, either on a uh, cluster-wide scope or in a namespace scope, uh, selects uh, resources, so based on their attributes. So it's actually, this is kind of more about the attributes, it's about object, um, name, namespace, API group, and, and resource in the context of like deployment or, or pod or things like that. And then it relates those to some actions you can do on that. Then the second, the binding, actually gives you then, well, this user is bound to this role. So that's very classic RBAC. Uh, 
Um, then next, it's, what's good about this model is that it's very extensible. It's an open API. Um, you can add your custom verbs. You can add custom sub-resources. You can use custom resources. And this all works the same. It's not specific to just Kubernetes uh, native things. And if you are a user that can edit these roles, actually, you cannot expand your uh, set of privileges. Um, so even though I can edit a role within my namespace, I cannot create cluster-wide things or, or kind of delegate stuff I already don't have access to. But it's not a language. It's, um, well, it's an API that it's declarative, but it can do only so many things. And um, one of the means to expand these over time has been uh, using a common expression language, uh, which is a non-Turing complete ex expression language so we can um, look at before running it, we can know how, what is the cost of running it in terms of CPU and memory and stuff like that. So we, this is very important in API servers, so we don't use um, well, a, lot of, a lot of those and, and kind of get malicious expressions in there. Um, so that's, that's been rolling out in, across all of Kubernetes API servers lately. Uh, one example of this is in the structured authentication and authorization configuration. Um, there's been a long-standing effort. I, we started talking about it in 2017, something like that, uh, on removing or, I mean, extending the flags, making the API server better than using flags when, when uh, running the Kube API server, and instead use some structured file. Well, we all love YAML, so you have a lot of YAML there. Um, you get to choose, for example, multiple uh, OIDC authenticators, you can have multiple webhook authorizers. Um, you can write your own expressions. So if, if you have a prefix in your OIDC thing, you can remove the prefix and maybe add some other prefix before kind of resolving the username and all, all things like that. And uh, this is a very powerful, um, powerful feature in recent versions. And then in Kubernetes 131, we got label and field authorization. Um, this is super powerful, uh, except it's limited in a couple different ways. Um, so what this actually lets you do is on certain webhook requests, um, the ones listed here, list watch and delete collections, uh, you actually do get access to some of the selectors uh, that um, are kind of driving the ABAC-y kind of aspects of uh, Kubernetes authorization. Um, and this fixes a couple of different use cases. Um, it makes it so uh, you can kind of lock down certain things. A great example is if you are a controller that's kind of delegating access to secrets, um, you can lock down the access to the secrets that you can actually view on the cluster. Um, so another example would be like if you're an ingress controller, um, making sure that you're locked down specifically to only seeing the certificates that you need um, to drive ingress rather than all the, all the, uh, all the secrets in that namespace. Um, this also solves a pretty important security problem with uh, the kubelet, which the kubelet could previously be kind of like god mode and see all the pods in the cluster before. Now we can limit its view down to just specifically the pods on it on the particular node it, uh, that it owns. Um, but uh, most importantly, this is kind of not a kind of silver bullet for solving multi-tenancy or generic kind of filtering of listing resources in Kubernetes. All of this is kind of um, just a modest extension to the existing webhooks in a way that's kind of meeting, uh, meeting some of the concerns we have today with um, just uh, what we've already built. Yeah, we want to go step by step, uh, making things better. Yeah. Um, so I kind of have this slide to go over the, the gotchas that everyone kind of knows about today with Kubernetes. Um, these are the things that's not doing well. Uh, a really good example is basically its limited querying capabilities. So you can't really ask um, what, are all the all, what are all the resources I can access in the system beyond uh, a particular namespace. Um, there's no question or no API that you can say um, who are all the people that have access to modify this particular resource. Um, so it's very one-dimensional. You can only ask the question, um, can I perform this action on this particular thing? Um, you can't model anything in terms of deny rules where um, the access is accepted by default, but then you say excluding these particular things um, because that actually would require a design where you have to have multiple layers of processing the authorization logic. Um, there's really no impersonization, sorry, impersonation framework. Um, or 
Yeah, there is, but like... Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean... No, delegation. Yeah. yeah, there's no real delegation. So the, the main use case for this, there is impersonation, but there is no way for you to say, I'm a controller acting on behalf of this particular user. Um, let me maintain my current privileges, but for the sake of this particular one action, I'm going to perform it on behalf of this other user. Um, so that is kind of a limitation that's really frustrating if you're out there writing custom controllers. Um, then there's no kind of temporality to any of this. So you can't say, um, we're having an incident, um, an outage right now. We want to give access to this person cluster-wide to solve that outage for the next hour. But like, they shouldn't forever have access, uh, God mode, for this cluster, just trying to fix this, this problem. Um, then any form of, kind of, uh, of inheritance only works kind of at the, the cluster-wide scope. So you can't really get super granular with the kind of delegating access there. And then all this is uh, eventually consistent. So if you want to have guarantees that you've revoked access and going forward someone will not accidentally see something, you really don't have that guarantee. And that, that kind of central problem of changing access but still eventually resolving it where folks could gain access to something they shouldn't see is called the new enemy problem. So these are some, some of the things, but now we're what we're here for is like, how do we go forward? How do we make some of these things better? The reasons why these haven't been sold, for example, the um, field and label selectors, I think issue was opened in 2015, 16, something like that. Um, and there are problems also like implementing solutions to these, uh, which are, because they're really hard. But um, we would like to, well, with this talk, we're gonna show a couple of things we can do. A um, couple of solutions, but really like for you all in the audience, um, come and join the community and kind of see how do we, how do we fix these, how do we uh, lock some of the things down while not solving. We, we won't have anything that will solve all of these problems at the same time. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. And so we're, we're going to cover kind of like what the future foundations of Kubernetes looks like as well, um, just because all this stuff has to work going forward. We're trying to like solve the authorization problems, but also as Kubernetes itself is changing, we need to solve authorization problems for the future. Yep, so one of the kind of, when, when we're using more and more um, Kubernetes as a generic control plane framework, these issues start to pop up. Uh, if we talk about federation, then we know that, well, first we need to authenticate the user. How do we authenticate users across different Kubernetes clusters? Uh, well, there's different ways. I mean, you can do it with OIDC uh, and some other things, but Spiffy is really uh, all about how to, um, how to get one trust domain to trust another trust domain. And it really excels at that. So it's gonna be interesting to see how these things evolve um, going forward and how we can integrate more natively there. Then if we have different levels of trust domains, we want to have often some, some kind of policy which apply globally or you know, like in a more general sense, but you actually need to do the authorization decisions always locally um, if you, in order to be available. So you need to sync partial, partially the authorization data between different trust domains. And there are, I mean, you can do this with controller runtime, you can build your own controllers to do this, but we're still yet to find one of some kind of a little bit higher level that would kind of help us with some of the syncing problems or common, common um, corner cases. And then there's a, a principle that you can use that is kind of bind principle upwards or resources downwards. So I have an uh, example here. Um, here is an example of how you can structure. If you have a tree structure of, of global, region, and local, if we call it like that, and you have a global rule, then that global rule should bind to global principles. But if you want to have inheritance, then you can bind either to the, the global resources or to resources downwards. This means that if you do it, then you need to sync also this, these global kind of bindings um, down to the, the more finer levels. But then the interesting one is in the middle here, where you have a kind of region level rule. Now it's, you might want to bind to the, the kind of global identities, or you want to bind to the region level identities. But then you shouldn't be able to bind to resources above your level, because then you could start kind of seeing up. Um, or maybe it's, uh, that's what you want, but then you're uh, 
changing the trust domains or then you're breaking through trust domains. So these, these kind of example, this is an example of how you can kind of um, make a tree-like system um, at least have some isolation uh, between each other. Uh, notably, if, if this was a Kubernetes system, um, you can actually have a namespace scope service account, if that was the smallest level, actually look cluster-wide. So it actually doesn't adhere to, to this principle by design, but, but still, that gives some complications sometimes. Then KCP, there was a really good um, talk from Stefan. Uh, just uh, the previous talk about KCP, um, it's a generic framework for taking Kubernetes, but removing everything that is container related. So we're left with um, APIs like namespace, secret, config map, and, and such. Uh, but there's no deployments, no node, and, and these things. And this really, the project is about, it's a CNCF project, it's about focusing on three different levels of, of kind of personas, the platform builders, and then service providers. The service providers you could think of like as an app store, um, where you, you make the apps and then the platform builders install the apps and then the consumers are the users of the phone. And um, here we're running into some limitations and, and thinking what is the best way forward. One example, um, this is also a playground for these the new kind of ideas in this space and, and here is uh, the delegation idea that we talked about um, has a proposal in KCP to call, be called a warrant. Um, so you can kind of act as yourself, but get someone else's privileges for a short uh, amount of time. Similar to the set effective UID or set UID in, in uh, Linux. Cool. So that's kind of the future vision of Kubernetes, right? It's kind of starting to abstract itself beyond just even containers. Um, so how are we going to move forward with kind of authorization in that space? Uh, so uh, I think if we go back to the research that I was showing earlier, uh, it makes sense to start with what was the latest. Um, the latest is, is actually called Reback, which is relationship-based access control. Um, and in 2019, the thing that actually made this popular was that Google wrote a paper on it. Um, they called the paper Zanzibar after the internal system that Google uses to power their product suite and check uh, permissions across everything. So that drives all the permissions on uh, Google Photos, uh, Google Docs, Gmail, um, all the way through to their cloud IAM as well. Um, so SpiceDB, uh, which is a project my company works on, so I am biased, um, is a database that is modeled basically after Google's Zanzibar paper. Uh, we follow the principles in that paper to the T and then kind of extend it beyond Googleisms um, that only pertain to deploying, uh, deployments inside of Google and make it kind of more friendly for companies external of Google to actually use this stuff in their own applications. Uh, conceptually, you can think of it as a database that stores authorization data and indexes it specifically for asking questions related to access control. Um, the really powerful concept with this is actually it lets you have a platform team operate your authorization stack. So you can have one centralized deployment of this where you can enforce best practices and have experts kind of consult across your whole business to understand and make sure that you're doing the best practices for authorization. And there's actually a CNCF project um, that is similar to this. It's, uh, SpiceDB isn't the only one trying to do this, and that's Okta's OpenFGA. So you can also go explore kind of the competing technologies in this space. Um, but if we kind of frame it like I framed OPA earlier, you can see that there is kind of the data, the schema, and the engine. Um, in this case, it's SpiceDB's query engine. But all of this kind of fits in one box because it is a database. So the data actually lives inside of SpiceDB and is managed by SpiceDB, and that way you can actually account for the consistency uh, of the data when you're actually making queries. Um, so this actually checks all the boxes that we were looking at before. But that didn't answer the question of like how this would look like integrated in Kubernetes. Um, so at Paris, KubeCon Paris, uh, we actually launched a Kube API proxy that's powered by SpiceDB. This explicitly sits in front of the Kubernetes API and kind of man in the middle is your traffic. But what it lets you do is define your own custom SpiceDB schema and data that is then checked whenever requests flow into Kubernetes. So you could have a completely different uh, application uh, that 
is driving all of your users, that has all of its authorization logic, and it has absolutely nothing to do with Kubernetes, but it actually does define the cluster admins on your cluster. Um, and that can actually start making authorization decisions on behalf of Kubernetes. So you can actually just kind of either turn off Kubernetes authorization altogether and rely on this, or use it in combination with an external system that's checking everything before and after. Um, and the reason why we built this as an API proxy is because of the limitations in the webhooks that we were kind of mentioning earlier. So SpiceDB uh, Kube API proxy can actually filter individual results coming out of list um, list APIs. So you can only actually see views of the cluster that you have access to um, and on an individual resource basis, not on like a whole namespace basis. Um, and it definitely solves a bunch of the problems that uh, we were talking about earlier with uh, asking different questions like discoverability, who can perform these operations, who are all the people that can manipulate this particular resource. Um, we handle the synchronization for you, and then uh, it's really, really easy to delegate uh, for a different user's permissions because that's all just built into SpiceDB. Um, but it does have this caveat of kind of running in this privileged um, position in front of the Kube API server for today. So here's kind of a visualization of that. You can see kind of the model that Lucas presented earlier all lives inside of Kubernetes, and then we kind of pre-check requests coming into that, and then we filter results coming out of that. Yep, and then there's another nice project by Micah here in the audience as well, um, where he's integrating CDAR with Kubernetes. And um, the reason that we would like to do this is if we looked at the admission, authorization and admission, they are separate stages, um, but, and you need separate languages. So RBAC in one, and then uh, common, expression, uh, common expression language in one. Um, but with, with something like this, you could model both uh, stages at once. So have one language where we'd say that, uh, let this user do this only if the body is like this. Um, so then it's conditional and actually would traverse that, and we'll, we'll see if we can get some of those capabilities into, into Kubernetes as well. Um, CDAR is a non turing complete uh, language as well. It's even analyzable fully by, by kind of maths, um, and um, open source um, made by Amazon. And um, here in this, this kind of experiment, we can also do kind of this policy tiering, uh, which is a hard problem, but, but solvable. Um, we can kind of store uh, the policies in for example, uh, Kubernetes CRDs or some other data store, um, but no data is kind of, we don't need the data here in this case. Um, there's some experimental partial evaluation, so like these kind of lookup type queries could possibly be done, um, but that's still to be, to be kind of determined. Um, and then one of the things I'm excited about is that if you have a front proxy, then giving it only per permissions to uh, impersonate some kind, uh, types of users with a, in, a, in some trust domain. Um, so here is what that would look like. Now, instead of being before and after Kubernetes, it's actually hooking out in the middle of the uh, Kubernetes request chain um, twice and um, handling it all like with, with one language. Um, so that, that's the second solution or kind of idea to, to tackle some of these problems. As again, I said, like, we don't have a solution that would tackle every problem. Um, I don't think necessarily such a thing exists. But um, the third one would be that like, we could build a lot of controllers, right? So in the example of, of uh, I mean, you can essentially solve any problem in computer science by another level of indirection, according to the famous quote. Um, and uh, for example, if roles and role bindings in Kubernetes don't have a TTL, we can make a controller that just deletes them after some time. Uh, we can make different types of other delegation semantics and, and things. But um, what we're trying to figure out here is like, what are the uh, right levels of sophistication between uh, core and out of core? Um, and also, can we find some projects that work for a sufficient uh, kind of large mass of, of users uh, for these uh, similar problems? And then finally, going back to the privilege, privilege escalation example, um, you can actually solve this today by a user um, being able to uh, create a, a deployment which would refer to a secret that they don't have access to. You can prevent this using the, a common expression, common expression language rule. You see it's a little bit lengthy in the beginning because we need to kind of traverse the, object, the JSON object. But once you get there, you can actually ask the authorizer that is the current user 
able to see the secret that is being referenced. So it's going to make this kind of call to the Kubernetes authorizer. So that's kind of that's kind of cool. But um, yeah, there's more. Yeah. So mm. Kubernetes is just the first step, right? Like the rest of this conference, the second half of it is the cloud native ecosystem. There's a whole bunch of tools out there that are all integrating with Kubernetes, and all those tools also need to be thinking about how their authorization is working and um, in tandem with Kubernetes itself. So a really great example of that would be Argo CD, often given privilege, um, a system completely external to Kubernetes, but is manipulating Kubernetes and creating all the resources on your behalf. It'd be really great if that was kind of cohesively managed with one single authorization system. Um, if there's one kind of takeaway from this talk that you get, uh, it should be that authorization is super complex and you should not be rolling your own. Please do not try to implement it yourself without at least first evaluating existing tooling in the space and existing models uh, that uh, are out there. So you at least familiarize yourself with some of the problems that you're gonna face in the future. Um, and then, the ultimate goal of this is to kind of have this Docker moment um, that we had with containers back in the day where everyone kind of was able to gather around common <coughs> solutions to solving these problems in a generic fashion where we could all kind of build on top of and be kind of supportive of each other. So with that, I want to thank everyone. Um, if you saw any project in this talk that was interesting to you, please join their communities. Everything we mentioned is open source, so they're all kind of uh, looking for more contributors and more interest. And then also, uh, Otset is hiring. Um, if you're looking to work on a database as an engineer, um, we have open roles for that. And is Upbound hiring at all? Yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Everyone is hiring. Um, yeah, so thank thanks you. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.